Hey everybody. Okay, why is this turning up? Not turning sideways. Okay, I guess it's still sideways. Right, okay, so um, I had already started a video and then somebody rang me. Shuli rang me. <laughs> I cut off, so I had to do this all over again. I was already like nine minutes in, but oh well. Okay, so um, I'm going to read John 4, and uh, yeah, this is one of my favorites. It's about the Samaritan woman. Okay, so I'll probably only get halfway through the chapter because it's a big chapter and there's lots to talk about. Okay, so chapter four, verse one. So when the Lord learned that the Pharisees had been told that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, okay? So he wasn't actually putting people into the water. He was there though, but his disciples were doing that. Um, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Now he had, he had to go through Samaria so he arrived at a Samaritan town called Sychar, near the tract of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Um, now, verse 4, there's a little star, so I'm just going to read the, what the stars are. Jesus went through Samaria to show that he is the savior of all people. And Samaria was centrally located between Judea south and Gal Galilee in the north. Um, the Jews despised Samaritans because they were the Jews who had intermarried with non-Jews and followed a heretical religion. Most Jews traveled out of their way to avoid Samaria. Okay, so we really have to set up this big picture here because this is super important to understand why this chapter and why the story is so significant. So, um, basically, Samaria, which is a kind of region of land, um, is between is located between Galilee, which is kind of north in Israel, and not too far north, but kind of north in Israel, and then Jerusalem, which is more southwest. And... Um, Samaria is kind of a big chunk of land in, in there and has its own little towns and villages and whatnot. So the problem with Samaria was that it, and now I can't remember who the Jews intermixed with, but they, inter, they ended up intermixing with another uh, culture of people who were not Jewish. And, you know, you can look back in the Old Testament where it says God said, don't intermarry with people of other religions, with other faiths, just stay within the Jewish culture and within Israel because you will end up getting dragged away and worshiping idols and pagan, pagan religions and stuff. So it wasn't that God didn't like other people, it's that they were pagans and they didn't acknowledge him as God. And God said to Israel, don't intermarry with these people because they'll drag you down, pretty much. So uh, this is what happened. These Jews ended up intermarrying with uh, other people and um, th their belief system ended up becoming mixed. So they did know Jewish tradition and Jewish culture and they um, did believe in God and in the Torah and in the law. And yet they had, um, they had influence of these pagan religions and idolatry and all this stuff. So it was kind of a mix. Um, and so to a pure Jew, this is just like, oh my gosh, you're unclean. You're, you know, you might as well be pagan. So the Jews would actually avoid going anywhere near Samaria because to them, it would make them unclean. They would, these people were pagans. Um, even though they were half Jews to them, they were pagans. They might as well be Gentiles. They might as well be, you know, idol worshipers, whatever. Um, and so they really avoided them like the plague. And not only did well, I'll get to that in a second. But anyway, um, so Jews would never go through Samaria. And Samaritans probably would never go to Jerusalem or most of the towns in Galilee because they didn't want to be around Jews because they knew Jews hated them and so they probably hated them back and blah, blah, blah. So it's a big deal, the fact that Jesus, not only being a Jew but being a man, would actually purposely go through Samaria. So it's my belief and understanding that God... His father sent him there for a purpose, for a reason, and we will see why. Um, okay, so verse 6. Um, so he arrived in a town called Sychar, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was then about the sixth hour. Then a woman from Samaria came to drink water, or draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone off into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman asked him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. Um, and I'll pause there again because there's more information to be had. So, um, Jacob's well, Jesus was tired. He sat down at this well. Okay, uh, It was the sixth hour. So it was the middle of the day. And anybody who's been to Israel knows that um, 
Now, Israel does have cooler times in the year, but even still, at the middle of the day, that's the hottest time of the day, so it's roasting. Nobody in their right mind, usually it was women that came and drew the water out. They pulled it out of a well through, with a bucket and they chucked it in their little, in their you know, big water jars, right? So it was hot business. <laughs> it was not an easy job. It was laborious. And so the women usually did it. So the fact that she was out in the middle of the day was kind of weird because most women would have come out in the morning or in the evening when it was cooler um, and it was really hot at this time of day. So, and she was like the only person there. So right there you think, okay, why is she the only woman at this well? And why is she here in the middle of the day? There's a reason why. Um, and if you kind of think further, okay, she must, maybe she's avoiding people, but we shall see that. So Jesus is there in the middle of the day and he says, give me a drink. Uh, so the disciples weren't there. They were gone getting food, thankfully, because Jesus then had the opportunity to just speak to her without being questioned by the disciples. Why are you talking to a woman? Why are you talking to a Samaritan woman? Anyways, she recognizes this. She sees, okay, this is weird. Why are you talking to me? First of all, because you're a Jew and Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And second of all, you're a man talking to a woman. That just does, never happens. And in my Bible, it says that the Jews considered Samaritan women ceremonially unclean, right? Probably because they considered them to be, to be Gentiles. So a Jew would never, a Jewish man especially, would never even touch a Jew, like a Samaritan woman wouldn't even touch her because if, if if she was considered unclean then the moment he touched her or anything belonging to her he, the jewish man would become ceremonially ceremonially unclean which means he couldn't take part in any rituals or in any sacrifices or in any feasts or anything and he had to go through a purification process right to be made pure again so there's like a whole big background to this so the fact that that Jesus is saying here give me a drink I'm thirsty she's like okay who are you is there something wrong with you she probably thinks he's crazy um, Jesus answered in verse 10 if you knew about God's gift of eternal life and who it says to you give who says to you give me a drink you would have asked him instead so Instead of me asking you for a drink, you would have been asking me for a drink if you knew who I was. And he would have given you living water, eternal life. And she said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, no bucket and rope, and the well is deep. How then, where then do you get this living water, right? So here's, here's what she's not understanding. She's like, okay, if, I, if you're asking me for water, a drink of water, and I give you the, my cup, you're gonna be drinking from my cup and this will make you ceremonially unclean. Why would you even wanna do that? because that kind of screws you over and you have to purify yourself all over again. So why are you even asking me? So, and, and what Jesus is saying is, well, actually, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for living water, right? So already Jesus has gone from the physical, talking about literal water, and now he's talking spiritually. He's talking in spiritual terms. So he's saying, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for living water instead and I would give it to you I would give you living water or eternal life right um, so she says to him ah oh, you've no bucket and rope how and the well is deep where do you get this living water right so she's still thinking physical like okay no he's talking about actual water um, and he and then she goes on to say in verse 12 are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and who used to drink from it himself uh, and his sons and his cattle also Jacob was the the grandson of the patriarch Abraham. So Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, and those kind of three names are kind of the Jews' right to identity, right? So um, you, you can see when the Pharisees were talking to Jesus, oh, we're of our father Abraham, we're of the father Abraham. That was kind of like their claim to fame. Oh, we're of him. And Jesus is like, no, you're actually the son of the devil <laughs> but anyways so she's saying well this is you know like this is his grandson's well you know so for in her mind this is a big deal and I'm sure to a lot of Samaritans this was kind of their claim to Jewish fame is that well this is you know Jacob's well so this is a big deal and you're tr you're trying to say that you're greater than Jacob um, and his answer to her is verse 13 Jesus answered her everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again 
but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. But the water that I give him will become in him a spring or a well of living water, satisfying his thirst for God, welling up, continually flowing, bubbling within him to eternal life. Right? So what he's saying is, I don't care that this is Jacob's well. That has n nothing to do with anything. You're still thinking in the physical woman. <laughs> you know, he, you're still thinking physical terms. I'm talking to you about eternal things, right? So he's trying to kind of, okay, the water that I give you will never run dry. If you receive this water or my salvation that I'm giving you, right? If you receive it from me, you will never be thirsty again. You will never have to look anywhere else in the world for satisfaction because I'm it. I am where the buck stops. And so what he's saying is, um, not only will I satisfy your thirst for anything else in life, but this, this well, this water that I'm gonna give you, right? And he's also talking about the Holy Spirit here, will continue to flow until you reach eternal life. Right? So you will never have to look ever again. Um, and not only that, but you can then go and offer others to drink from this well, right? Because you can't offer anybody something that you don't have. So if you have this well of water flowing to eternal life, then you can offer it to other people and then they can be filled. Their thirst will be quenched forever, right? So anyways, in verse 15, the woman is just like, what? Um, and she says to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not get thirsty nor have to continually come all the way here to draw. So again, she's still thinking in physical terms. She's still thinking, oh my gosh, does this mean I never have to put all this work in and come out and fill my water jar every day? And not only that, I'm sure she's thinking that means I never have to come in contact with anybody ever again because I never have to come to this well again. Right? So if, you're, if you look at it that way, there must be some shame or guilt or sin that she's hiding because she's avoiding people, right? And the only reason why you would avoid everybody is if there was something that you were ashamed of or guilty of that people knew about and you know they would talk about you or whisper or point, ah, that's your woman there. Um, and so Jesus, catches her out and he basically in verse 16 he says at, at this Jesus said go call your husband and come back right um and right there she's like uh the woman answered I have no husband and Jesus said you're yeah you're right you don't have a husband for you have had five husbands and the man you are now living with is not your husband you have said this truthfully um and there's a star uh in, Verse 18, God does not regard cohabitation as marriage. Marriage is a binding legal covenant between a man and a woman before God. Okay, so there you go. Um, so yeah, you can't live together. That's not marriage. There you go, get married. Um, for you have had five husbands and the husband you are now living with is not your husband. Or sorry, the man you are living, now living with is not your husband. You have said this truthfully. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. I can see this. You are prophetic. Um, and, and then all of a sudden, it's like, it totally changes. So, oh shoot, I'm going to run out of time. Okay, so she says, Sir, I see that you're a prophet. And then right here, she's thinking, Okay, I'm going to ask you a question that has been plaguing me for a long time. Because she just totally changes the subject. Maybe she doesn't want to talk about her husband's. But I also think that she really has a genuine question for Jesus. And seeing that he's a godly man and he's actually taking the time to talk to her, she says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place where one ought to worship is in Jerusalem at the temple. And, and Jesus replied, I'll finish with this. Jesus replied, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when God's kingdom comes, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans do not know what you worship, but we Jews do know what we worship, for salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and is already here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such worship people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, the source of life, yet invisible to mankind, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Gotta end there, because I have 30 seconds. So anyways, I will talk about that in the next video because it's, pff, wow. There's so much in this chapter. So anyways, um, yeah, catch up in uh, John chapter four, part two. There's probably gonna be a part, there will be a part three probably. So anyways, have a good day and enjoy.